Welcome to the System Simplified Podcast, where we feature top leaders who share stories on how to successfully systemize a business. Now, let's get started with the show. Hello, Adik Levitt here with the System Simplified Podcast, where we interview top entrepreneurs, founders, and thought leaders about systematizing a business. And this podcast is being brought to you by Business Success Consulting Group. At Business Success Consulting Group, we create custom processes and tailor-made business systems so businesses can thrive and grow. All right. And today's guest is Kirsten Melangelo, who is a leadership coach, and she's the founder of Illumination Coaching. Yes. Glad to be here. Thanks, Adi. You are very welcome. I'm so happy to have you here because we're going to have a very interesting con- uh, conversation about leadership. And we're going to tie it into systems. It's basically how, you know, I did, I interviewed many on this podcast and we talk usually about sales systems and marketing systems and delivery and operations, et cetera. But there is actually a system, in my opinion, also for leadership and for managing, because it's not something that you just do, you just throw out there and you don't have a way of doing it. And that's where you come into place and you work with leaders of the organization to coach them and to make sure that they are actually leading in the correct way or they have system of what they can apply. So I'm really excited to talk about systems and leadership and how we can actually match those two. How can we actually make them work? Yes, I agree. And there's a huge opportunity in this area for sure. Yeah. So Kirsten, let's start first of all with... Tell our listeners about you, about your career, about um, how you got to be a leadership coach. Oh, my gosh. Well, uh, the path is long and winding. Um, I will say I had a a series of careers in other areas. Um, My background is I'm an attorney. I had financial uh, background as well and spent a lot of time in nonprofit uh, raising money. And then through that process, you know, I, I became disenchanted slowly with working in a nonprofit environment and hired a coach for my own career transition and realized I had been coaching folks informally for many years. And so I decided, you know, that's really where my passion's around um, individual and leadership development. And so I went to coaching school, got my certification and uh, started my own business uh, 12 years ago. So yeah, been doing that ever since. And I just love it. And I realize that's the work that I'm here to do. That is fantastic. Fantastic. And, you know, before we get going about talking about leadership and systems, I mean, I really want to give a shout out to our mutual friend, Alice Tang, who introduced us. <laughs> She's amazing. Yes. Yeah. Good. That's right. So without Alice, uh, we wouldn't be connected. And she is so good at connecting and networking, etc. And I did I interviewed her for one of the episodes on this podcast, and it's fantastic. So if our listeners want to listen to it, is um, just search for my episode with Alice Tang, and you're going to have a blast listening to it. So thank you, Alice. All right. All right, Kirsten, let's start talking about that. Let's start talking about the systems and the leadership. So, um, you know, before the podcast started, we started talking about a workshop you were doing yesterday with some mm-hmm. leaders. Yes. So tell me more about that. Let's start with that point, because I think it's a, it really shows how you have to alloc- allocate specific time in order to strategize, in order to know how to lead, in order to make decisions. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, you asked if there are systems for leaders and there can be a tremendous number of systems, but one that I feel like is a foundational underpinning for a lot of this is the um, use it, it's a tool called the Eisenhower matrix. Some of uh, your listeners may be familiar with it. Um, it was basically the concept was created by former president and general Eisenhower, and it became popularized in Stephen Covey's book as well. And so um, it's basically a two by two block like matrix where there are four quadrants and it helps leaders to sort out the important from the unimportant, the urgent from the not urgent, and helps people to make better use of their time. So what I see a mistake with a lot of leaders is they, uh, especially in today's world where there's so much information, so many emails and chats, and we're slacking and we're texting and we're IMing, and (laughs) it's just like a nonstop flow of information. 
people need to get, leaders need to get in a place where they can be proactive and not reactive. And so leaders can become very ineffective quickly if they're just, a, you know, really focused on what's coming in their inbox. And so to take time every week to be systematic and planful and to spend a minimum of a half an hour and really looking ahead at their week, looking at the activities that they have on their plate um, and things that are coming in at them and the initiatives and projects they want to drive forward in a proactive way then they can use this Eisenhower matrix tool to help them to identify, you know, there are always going to be urgent things that come in that we need to deal with. There's like something happens, blows up with a client, we need to just jump in there and solve and fix and do. But a lot of our time needs to be spent in quadrant two, which is the not uh, not urgent, but important quadrant. I had to remember exactly which quadrant I was where. Right. <laughs> but it's um, basically, it's where our strategic planning lives. It's where we have our weekly meetings with our team, our one-on-one meetings, our own strategic just thinking time, uh, professional development, and our ongoing learning, right? So all of these things need to be done but they're never, it feels like they're maybe just always out there and we don't prioritize them. So these are the things we need to actually schedule on our calendar, blocks of time, either recurring or um, professional development might be scattered throughout the year. But to have those there, and those are the foundations of our time. Those are the, the choices that we're making. Our calendar should reflect the choices that we're making and our values. And that should always be filled in first then you can deal with the emergencies as they come up. Right. You know, and, and that sort of thing too. So what, what does this bring up for you as you're hearing this, Abby? Well, you know, it's really interesting because what I see is I see many business owners that are reactive. So that means that the urgent quadrant will take a lot of their attention because like from my viewpoint, that's where they don't have systems in place, right? They don't have processes and procedures documented, for example, I'm just talking from my world, right? Sure. So there they go get sucked into those ur- emergencies and it's urgent and it's urgent. So they can't really block time. Like I had a client tell me last week that she can't block time to actually do exactly what you were talking about in quadrant two, yeah. because it's always like, you know, it's like things are like balls in the air all the time, or there is like, you know, somebody needs her. So she needs to step in and, and figure it out, or she needs to go help a customer service person or what, what not. Right. So yeah. that's when I was interviewing her in terms of like, what mm. do we need to document first? So it definitely resonates with me because you have to have order in place to minimize those urgencies and those emergencies. You know, it's, it doesn't, you know, I, I'm really curious to see what you think. Like, what percent of the week should really be handling those urgent things? And what does it say about a business owner if they have too many emergencies? Right. Well, if they have too many emergencies, they need to call you, ID, to help them fix it. <laughs> well, they also need to call you, <laughs> Kirsten, yeah. so you can help them <laughs> guide them. But yeah, but it's, I, I think say... it's a good question for, the, for our listeners to reflect on if they find themselves yes. constantly, you know, with fires that they have to put out, right? It's very true. And there are a lot of reasons why we can get sucked into that, um, which is a which is a different, um, I'll set that aside for a minute. But to answer your first question about how much time, I mean, I think a minimum of an hour a week to be reflective on how you're spending your time and to be planful for the week ahead, I think is good. And then how much time you actually spend in the quadrant two activities Um, this is the important but not urgent area, um, is going to depend on the leader and the nature of what they do. But I would say probably a third to a half of our time should be intentional, proactive time. And then that free time in between is for, you know, dealing with emergencies or things that our staff needs us for as well. But if we are constantly on that, there's emergency after fire after fire, we have to look at what is driving that. Is mm-hmm. it our? It is it a drama? I mean, sometimes some folks are addicted to drama, or they need to be needed, right? And they like to play the martyr. So I think that there there are some interesting motivators behind why sometimes those uh, patterns are set up in people. And I think it's an opportunity to reflect with someone like yourself or myself how what's really driving that. 
And if it can be as simple as instituting some systems to help get those, um, deal with those emergencies, uh, you know, it makes a world of difference. I often think of the analogy of maintaining a car, right? If we maintain our car, if we get the tires rotated and the oil lube and filter and the big, you know, once a year uh, tune up, we often are not broken down on the side of the road. But it's the person that's constantly their car is breaking down. You wonder, you're probably not maintaining it very well, right? That's so I, I think that analogy is very apt in this situation too. So I think so too. You know, one of the analogies I like to give is like, let's say we have a bucket of water mm-hmm. and a bucket of water can only contain eight cups of water. Let's say each cup represents an hour in a day. Sure. Or maybe you are an entrepreneur, you're working 10 hours, 12 hours, what, what not. Okay. So let's say it can hold 10 cups. Yeah. But then you want to pour in 15 cups. Well, what will happen without a five? There will the overflow. There is no way you're going to fit it in. And yeah. I think a lot of the frustrations that they see with business owners is they feel unaccomplished because even if they accomplish those 10 hours, there are five that they did not and they feel guilty or they feel mm-hmm. tired because of that or they feel like you know they haven't made any forward progress. But if they actually take the time to actually take some drops of water out of that bucket and yeah. then put in the drops of water that are actually that second quadrant in terms of organizing, in terms of strategizing, in terms of figuring out how to get out of that rut of the 15 hours put into a 10-hour bucket, yeah. then they will be able to take more and more drops out and eventually they will be able to, the bucket will be full with activities that will actually allow others to fill their buckets, right? I mean, that's the analogy that I like to use, but I like the car mechanic too. The car, if you don't maintain the car, you're going to break over and over. And it's it's all really comes to predictability, right? And what is real. Like if you're trying to fill that bucket with 15 cups when it's only hold 10, or if you know that if you're not going to take your car to the mechanic and it's going to break down, you know that. As a leader, you should. If not, there is something wrong there. (laughs) <laughs> but it's a matter of, right? I mean, you know, if you if you keep hoping that you can keep driving the car without really taking it to the mechanic, we have a problem. Yeah. Well, we've seen that though too, right? Some people exactly. do that. It's kind of a wishful thinking too. Yeah. And you know what you brought up, Adi, something that I think that I get pushed back from folks in coaching and they say, well, Kirsten, you know, I'm already working 60 plus hours a week. How am I going to squeeze another half an hour for strategic thinking? you know, or to do, to go through the exercise of using the Eisenhower matrix. And I said, it's not a one for one swap. You're not necessarily just adding another half an hour. When you spend that half an hour being thoughtful about where you're spending your time and where you want to spend your time, you might discover, wait, last week I spent 10 hours on a project that one of my staff members should have done. Right. Right. So all of a sudden, investing that additional half an hour subtracted 10 hours from a future week when you realize, wait, you know, it gives us an opportunity to really step back and go, is this an important activity that I'm engaged in? And should, am I the one that should be doing it? Maybe it should be someone on your team that should be their responsibility and investing a little bit of time in training is going to set them up for success, right? Uh, And empowerment, or maybe you just need to hire a consultant for that one-off project that you shouldn't even be handling anyway, right? And as, as um, small um, like solopreneurs and, and new startups, it's like they're doing the marketing and they're doing the books and they're doing the promotional and social media and, and then actual work of whatever it is that they do in terms of a product or a service, right? And so it's just endless. And you're right, it very often, you know, 10 hours leads to 12 hours leads to 15 hours in the day. And so we do have to be so, I I think the word is, some people have a negative association with this word, but I like it ruthless. Um, I don't think of myself as a ruthless person, but I think of myself with ruthless when it comes to decision-making about my time. And so we do have to be a little harsh, I think, um, in order to really get the best uh, bang for our buck in terms of how we allocate our time during the week. I agree. I agree. I mean, that evaluation of importance is so important to do. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's interesting because I get the same pushback. It's in, it, just from a different... Yeah. yeah, because, you know, if let's say I go, okay, well, you know, it, the best thing in order to solve the situation is to actually have well-documented processes and procedures. I mean, the first thing, like, I'm already working so much. 
my staff is overloaded, my staff is overwhelmed, they are not going to find the time to do it. Or they get pushed back because usually I don't, I would not document with a business owner, right? I mean, if they, if they have staff, I would make sure we're doing the knowledge transfer from the staff, right? So, I, I, but they will go, well, you know, the staff is so, they get pushed back from the staff. We're already overworked. There is no time we're going to do that. But again, it's the same concept of, okay, well, at some point, you have to invest a couple of hours a week in order for you to actually be able to bring on more people or be able to scale in the future. So I really think it's also thinking in in the future, like what will happen in the future as opposed to being very reactive to what is happening right now. And that's, again, part of the strategy because sometimes the strategy can be painful. I mean, in the beginning, it might look like it's a painful move and it's easier, it's less painful to continue doing what you're doing, but it's... yeah. It's not. So that doesn't that doesn't get us to where we want to go. And if a business wants to be scalable, we need to think about that future state and how we're going to get there. And so a huge part of that is documenting the processes either to improve them with the current resources and staff you have or to grow them, right? Because hopefully uh, you're going to bring on more people and the folks you have are going to be elevated perhaps to um, more leadership, senior leader positions. And so then you, you bring on new staff well, they don't need to reinvent the wheel with the process you already have, right? Like let's set them up for success and creating that processes and procedures is a huge part of that. For sure. And having the leadership and basically wearing that leader hat is so important. So let's go back to the Eisenhower metrics. I'm really interested. So we have, first of all, let's cover the other two quadrants. So we know what they are. So we have the number one, which is the urgent. Yes. And then you have- And important. important. Well, number one is urgent and important. So it's the kind of thing where, you know, it's by the end of the day, basically, we're looking at like what's right in front of us. It needs to be conquered right now. Right. Yes. Second quadrant is important. Not not urgent, but important. So those are the, there are things that are important for us to do, again, strategic planning and development of staff and things like that, but they're not urgent that they have to be done today. They need to be done in dribs and drabs, you know, and scheduled out over time. Um, And very often they're uh, repetitive. So they might occur weekly or monthly or quarterly, things like that too. Right. So we have that. And then we have the third quadrant, which will be basically top left, bottom left, not top left, bottom left. Okay. (laughs) And that is urgent and not important. And so it may be urgent for others, but not important for you. So that a vendor might make a request. Oh, I want you to come to this so-and-so meeting. Um, Or someone on your team may need something from you or someone in another department. So it's it's urgent from their point of view, but it really is not important to you. These are tasks very often you can delegate or push off or, you know, mostly that's the delegate category. So maybe there's someone else in your organization it's a better fit for but it's not really important according to what you want to accomplish and what you want to drive forward. Um, And then the fourth quadrant, the bottom right, is not urgent and not important. And as you can imagine, if it's not urgent and it's not important to you, just get rid of it. So um, those are very often activities that we use to procrastinate or waste time with. So it can be like scrolling through social media or binge watching a Netflix show, things that really don't move our agenda forward and, you know, prevent us from being our highest and best self. I'm not saying don't watch your favorite Netflix show, but if we're doing it and we're really putting off stuff that we know we want to do, uh, then it's a problem. Absolutely. So let's say it can also come to go to your personal life. You know, if you decide that you want to be in shape, but you're doing actions that, you know, not important, not urgent, and they're not going to get you into shape, you know, so that's, it's a choice, but it's the wrong, it might not be the correct choice, right? So that's, yeah, so that would be that quadrant. So great. So how do you coach your clients to use that matrix? Sure. So I actually help them to fill it in. So we did that yesterday, their leadership development program, I had an example in each of the quadrants, And then I said, let's do this together. So, you know, I had everybody in the room name at least one item, like one recurring task or something that comes to them. And then as a group, we figured out which quadrant it went in. So they had a sense for what that, um, how they can use that. And so I've done that in coaching as well. Just 
to get it started because some of these things can sound very conceptual. Mm-hmm. And even though a tool like this is is quite easy to understand, uh, there can again be the kind of reluctance to actually use it until they see how it's being used. So I think definitely just pulling some examples out of your client and helping them to see, oh, wait, this is realistically where this goes um, is helpful. So one example that came up yesterday was uh, one of the leaders said, oh, I want to be able to delegate this, but the person isn't trained up enough where I can delegate it to them. And I said, well, then it falls in two quadrants. You have the training for that person. That would be quadrant two. So it's right. it's um, important, but not urgent. I mean, training generally falls in that category. And then um, once that person is fully trained and you feel like they have sufficient skills to be successful at it, you'll be able to, that'll be a quadrant three activity where basically you can delegate that work that used to come to you to them. So they were like, oh, I, I see how this works. So, you know, again, it's not magical, but I think just the practice of helping people understand how to use it can be really powerful. Very, very powerful. So then when you actually identify the different parts, the different items that go in each quadrant, what do you do next? Well, then um, you quadrant one, you do those things. <laughs> so if they're, um, you know, client emergencies or things like that, this like stuff that needs to be addressed right away. Um, the key part is quadrant two, not to just keep it on your quadrant two list, then you have to time block it. That's the key part with that one is to make sure that you go ahead and, and pull your calendar up and make sure that those things, you know, your quarterly strategic planning, your weekly team meetings and one-on-ones, all those things actually find a home on your calendar. Um, quadrant three, make a list for what you're going to be delegating into whom. So I keep a spreadsheet where I track with like my virtual assistant um, and other projects that I'm working on, items that are kind of outstanding that I've you know, delegated to someone else and tracked, you know, when they're due, who they're due by so that I'm able to follow up on that too. So that's part of my weekly activity too. Just look to see where those projects are, are, st- are standing. So that's how I use the Eisenhower matrix. How about you? What has your, been your experience with that? You know, I'm, I'm just thinking about, and I'll answer that one, but my thought before I forget what my thought was, sure, yep. you know, the urgent, because I sometimes the urgent can also be, yeah, it is the end of the day if you're using it daily, but it could also be used when you're strategizing, like let's say the supply chain problem. If somebody has okay. a supply chain problem or their vendors are, I'm mean, just thinking about one of my clients, you know, the vendors are not supplying what they need in order yeah. for them to then supply to their clients. So that's an urgent thing that the owner needs to handle because she has the expertise on how to do it, right? Sure. It's not necessarily Hopefully. something she's going to do at the end of the day, but it's something that should be top of mind in every activity that she does until this gets handled because without it, you can't have the other quadrants. So right. I think that's that's what I've seen in terms of like, you know, sometimes it might have to be a little bit of a longer um, mm. time. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, if it's the kind of thing where you're right, supply chain is a sticky wicket these days for a lot of people. So it might be the kind of thing where, yes, it lives quadrant one and it's top of mind. First of all, he or she, they're not going to forget it anyway. Like (laughs) that is probably the most pressing issue on their plate. Um, So yes, they'll put it in quadrant one. um, But you're right. It may take a number of days or weeks to resolve that. But again, as long as they they have a sense for it, the whole point of it is to create awareness and intentionality with how we use our time. So if they're already aware that's a quadrant one issue and they're taking steps to resolve it, I think they're using it in the way in which it was attended, even if it doesn't truly mean that it's going to get resolved that day. So that's a good. I, thanks for pointing out that nuance. That's it's, that's right. Yeah, I agree. So you know, my experience is the same. Of- what you were mentioning in terms of like, it makes you aware, right? When you're doing this exercise, it makes you aware that not everything is urgent, right? It just gets you to differentiate between the activities. You know, it's kind of like, I like to give the example of, let's say you had a, a ta- like you're doing arts and crafts and you're making jewelry, right? And you had bids all over the table in all different colors, shapes, sizes, you know, price range, etc. You know, it's really hard to then figure out where you're going to start. So Mm. I like to create those, um, imagine you have beans and each one of them, you know, using your label, I like using labels, so you can use your, 
<laughs> labeling machine and you can actually put a label on each one of those bins. So it's either going to be red, yellow, and green, or it can be expensive ones, not so expensive, and the least expensive, right? Or it can be sure. by size, or it can be by a style. So, but, but when you start doing that, you get a little bit more of a concept of organization. And yeah. the same thing with this matrix, it's instead of everything being equal, you start yes. differentiating by order of importance and it becomes, then you have something that is more important and something that is less important. So that's what, what, what I found when, I, when I've done that exercise or I see my clients do it. It just creates that, um, those silos in a good way. They still communicate to each other, and, but you figure out what, what you have to tackle next and then things get less overwhelming. Exactly. It's really true. That's a great example you shared with the beads. And it's, I, I think that's where leaders get into trouble is they think they're all these separate beads on the table and they're not. And I think that also leads to the sense of overwhelm. Mm-hmm. So what I really like about this tool is it creates intentionality and focus. Like these are my most important priorities as a leader, Right. And the other stuff is just not as important or someone else can do it. And uh, another, another good resource with regard to this is uh, the book Essentialism by Greg McKeon. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Have you read that book? I haven't, but I will definitely check it out. Alice Tang is a big proponent of that book. So, <laughs> all right. If Alice does it, I'm going to definitely <laughs> check it out. No, no problem. But it's a, it's a book really about focus and saying, you know, it's basically another uh, way of, of using the Eisenhower matrix. Like what's really essential and important to my success, my business, my life, you know, what have you. And what can is just kind of background noise and not so essential. And so, um, Anyway, just another resource in this kind of area that we're talking about today. No, it's great. It's like, you know, Michael Hyatt, he calls it IPAs, right? Income producing activities, right? So because us as entrepreneurs, we can be very good in a lot of things, but you yep. can't, y- you can be very productive and cre- and do a lot of things with that, within the time that you have. But still, even if you're like super productive and super efficient, you will hit a ceiling at some point because we only have that many hours in a day. Yeah. So I think it's looking at where can I create the biggest impact, right? It's taking that little, it's kind of like investing really the money here. I mean, mm-hmm. the attention yeah. and the time is the resource. I mean, those are the resources that you have. So you want to make sure that you actually maximize your investment of time. So for instance, as an example, I can um, sit down and do the books for my company. I'm very bo- good bookkeeper, right? Or I can hire sure. somebody at in the yeah. same time. I can come up with some kind of... Uh, talk to my marketing consultant and come up with this marketing strategy. For instance, you know, it's actually happened this morning. You know, I want to create an online course, right? So I was talking to my marketing company that does this podcast and uh, which is Rise25. So I have to give them a shout out. And um, we were talking about creating an online course. Well, that is future. That is me being able to help many more people. That is me being able to reach more people. And that our thinking or strategizing about how to do that, it's much better than pay, you know, than me doing the bookkeeping, although I'm really good at it, but I can find other people that are really good at it and then both get done at the same time. Because another thing you can say, oh, well, you know, I can do the bookkeeping at night, but at some point you have to go to bed too. Right, exactly. And that's exactly why I hired a virtual assistant because I said, you know, these are hours that I can be delegating to someone else and they free me up. I can charge for that hour. I can be working during that hour and the person can be helping with the administrative task. And it's been a great, there's no going back now. I love, my assistant is fantastic. She's so helpful. And um, I can't imagine life now without her there. So yeah, the same for me. I mean, I, we talked, I think last, before we, a few months ago, we're talking about virtual assistants and it's definitely, it is a lifesaver for sure. Mm -hmm. And you know, you mentioned at the beginning in terms of the syndrome or the, I don't know if I call it a syndrome, but it's more the, um, what's happening with, uh, with entrepreneurs, the, that martyr, you know, being a martyr or working the 16 hours a day or getting sacked. You know, when you are sucked into working in the business and you're being a technician in the business, use the e theory yeah. um, or analogy. 
you really, it's hard to get out of there, right? It's hard to elevate yeah. yourself to a different position in the company because you are feeling very needed or this is what you know how to do or you feel like the business is not going to run forward without you doing that. But that's where, mm -hmm. you know, that's another aspect. Those are the aspects of trust of, right? I mean, there are different things that come into play. Control. Right. Exactly. Right? Yeah. No one else or perfectionism. No one else will do it as good as I do. Well, is that really true? <laughs> and we have to challenge all these assumptions that sometimes we make or we get caught in. We do. And I think, you know, what I like to do is always look at people that have made it. That's why I like on this podcast, I interview thought leaders like yourself and definitely successful ones. So you definitely made it, but I'm looking at, <laughs> yeah, you are like super, you know, I know, I know you are and you do big workshops and big work with the big companies and, uh, but you also look at business owners that have employees that they, they grew from 10 employees to 500 employees, right? So that what I have, I'm very curious about what is the common denominator? You know, what do they have in common? And it's really the key to their success from what I found is the ability to let go. And they're perfectionists. You know, they have control issues. You know, they want to be in control, but they learn to let go and to trust others. And yeah. that's where they start really to scale and grow and be able to take a vacation or go yeah. skiing or do whatever or spend time with their families, mm -hmm. right? But still yeah. have, do what is important for them. Like I was talking to one of my clients today that, you know, he systematized his entire business and then now he moved on to another business. Mm -hmm. But his passion is really his uh, ministry and the things that he does for his church. Yeah. And um, he wants to do more of that. And he wants to do it full time. So he's living a life with a purpose, yeah, but he's man. He he's not necessarily. It, it took a, you know, it's the change of that mindset that it's okay. The business will live without me. The business is the economic machine that actually will allow me to do what I really I'm really passionate about. But also yeah. creating a beautiful life for all the families that are working for him. It's not just sure. yourself. Exactly. What a nice story. Yeah, it's lovely you. to hear when people are able to do that and figure, make that work for them and others. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And would you agree that, I mean, for me, it is a decision, right? I mean, you know, if it's the difference between doing it and not doing it is just having that decision. You know, I think there is a saying by, I mean, Henry Ford had this um, quote of like, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Yes. Or, and to follow that up, I will say from Yoda from Star Wars do or do not do, there is no try. <laughs> that's true, very true. Right? Either like to do it and commit to it or to say, that's not for me or I don't want to or what have you. And there you go. I agree. And with that, I think, you know, we definitely thank you so much, <laughs> Kirsten, for giving us the great tool, you know, the Eisenhower Matrix. Obviously, it's been around since when, when was I... Um, Eisenhower was, I think, a president in the 50s. I believe in the 50s, yes. <laughs> yeah, mid 50s around, yeah, so around that time. And so it's been around, but, and it's a tool. I mean, if you Google, for our listeners, if you Google the Eisenhower matrix, you're going to see it, you're going to see a picture mm -hmm. of it. And then um, do what Kirsten told us to do here. She definitely walked us step by step on how to get it done. And if our listeners would like to get a hold of you, how can yes. they do that? Oh, yeah, great. Um, well, you can visit my website, illuminationcoaching.com, uh, or email me directly, uh, Kirsten, K I R S T E N, at illuminationcoaching.com. And happy to schedule an intro call and to learn more about you and your needs in regards to leadership development. Fantastic. And I also will say before we end that you have great videos that you make and you post on LinkedIn. Oh, thank you. Yes, I have a series called Get Curious with Kirsten on YouTube. So check that out as well. It's wonderful. I watch those videos and I <laughs> learn so much and they're inspiring. They're not very long. No, and, they're like five minutes. Yeah. yeah. And you learn so much out and, and Kirsten really gives it. She just gives away that knowledge, which is beautiful. And I'm sure you're going to learn a lot. So a lot of ways to get a hold of you. And yes. I hope our listeners do. And thank you so much for being a guest on this podcast. Thank you, Adi, for asking me today. It really means a lot. So it's nice to see you again, too. You too. Thanks for listening to the System Simplified podcast. 
We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.